Attorney Davis Slane says he's taken on more than 400 sex offender cases. People who urinated in public or the Romeo, what we call the Romeo and Juliet, where the young man may have been just a little bit older than the girl or vice versa. Uh, they're the ones that are typically being removed. In many situations, the offenders were on the list way past their punishment because the laws kept changing. And they've had a number of changes or revisions to the Sex Offender Registration Act over the last 10 or 15 years. Um, and the court said those later laws could not apply retroactively. Coming off the registry are mostly level one or level two offenders, which doesn't include those who've committed violent and heinous sex crimes. Slane says under the new law, a judge is able to decide a punishment on a case-by-case -case basis. In 1994, President Bill Clinton signed into law the Jacob Wetterling Crimes Against Children and Sexually Violent Offender Registration Act, pushing state dollars into the creation of the registry that to this day notes sex offenders detailing where they live, their picture, and other data. For some time, there's been a thinking backed by numbers that the registration is flawed, noting that sex offenders are not at a high risk of lapsing back into their criminal ways. Recently, an expert at the University of Houston Law Center took the stats and cast doubt on much in Jacob's Law, calling the recidivism concept a total myth. Let us welcome into midpoint that very professor, a visiting criminal law scholar at the University of Houston Law Center, Melissa Hamilton. We're also joined by talk radio host and co-creator of the Amber Alert, one who staunchly defends what the law entails, Rick Roberts. Thank you both for joining us. Thank you for having Thank me. You. Melissa, I'm going to begin with you, and I want to specifically go to the quote that you gave. The assumption that sex offenders are at a high risk of recidivism has always been false and continues to be false. It's a myth. Could you expand on that, please, and how you came to that, and what backs that up? Sure, and, and I want to be clear. There are sexual predators out there. So anybody uh, potentially can cite uh, anecdotal stories of a predator who was caught, and then we find that they've had multiple victims in the past. And unless they're sufficiently incapacitated, they might go on to offend against multiple other victims. Uh, the public, though, um, has a belief that the prevalence of sexual predators are, uh, is higher than it actually is. So, for example, surveys indicate that the general public believes that sex offenders are at high risk of recidivism, that almost all of them have past um, unknown victims and will, again, without sufficient incapacitation, uh, commit crimes against additional victims. Uh, but studies uh, show that that's not the case. So, for example, both states as well as the federal government with the Department of Justice, they often track uh, released prisoners for recidivism. In terms of general recidivism, which is basically committing any other offense, sex offenders are actually as a group at lower risk of general recidivism. Lower risk, for example, than drug offenders, than uh, property offenders, and not other non-sexual violent offenders. Um, so these studies indicate both, again, state studies as well as national studies. Um, now, it is true that sexual recidivism, sexual offenders, are at higher risk than these other groups, but the rates are much lower than the public believes. So across these studies, uh, the general rates that we're seeing of sexual recidivism for sex offenders, which is you know committing another sex crime at, upon release, is between generally 3% and 14%. Uh, most of these studies um, are in the single digits in term, terms of percentages. And indeed, the Department of Justice, uh, which has the nationally representative sample, their rate was at a 5% re-arrest re -arrest rate um, for sexual recidivism. So that's just much lower than most people believe. Okay, let me get to Rick on this. Rick, there recently was a study. Wisconsin psychologist Dennis Doran says that the notion that all sex criminals are likely to reoffend, quote, there is no research support for that view, period. In light of that statement, in light of what Melissa has said, your reaction, because you certainly have a very emotional attachment to making sure that sex offenders stay away from kids. Absolutely. And, you know, this has been uh, dueling studies for as long as, as I've been involved with it, which goes back to 1994 little before that, actually. You know, for every study one cites, there's another study. You can, uh, you can go to uh, Pamela Van Wick's study. She does a, a psychological evaluation program uh, for incarcerated sex offenders. Uh, she did a study wherein 23 men that admitted molesting three victims each were then faced with a polygraph. The only way you could stay in the program and stay enrolled was to pass the polygraph. 
Well, all of a sudden, now each one of these men had hundreds of victims throughout their lifetime up to their incarceration. Um, you know, generally uh, 10 to 15 percent after five years, 20 percent after 10 years, upwards of 40 percent after 20 years is generally been the rule of thumb. You know, you, you can cite studies all day, all day long. At the end of the day, if you take something which can never be replaced, the innocence of a child, there's got to be a penalty to be, to be paid for that. Now, let me make one thing abundantly clear. You know, if, if you've had too much to drink and you're pulling over the country road and urinating on the side, you don't belong on the sex offender registry, as far as I'm concerned. Um, you know, if, uh, if it's six months before uh, the young lady's 18 and, and they've been together for three or four years, that's not what the sex offender registry was created for. Uh, but this free to be you and me hug a tree thing, can't we all get along? Look, there are two camps. Uh, those people that think sex offenders can't be cured and invariably will reoffend. Uh, generally speaking, nobody can prove that false, no can, nobody can prove that true. But the same goes for the recidivism rate. Really what we're talking about here, and, and the attorney is talking about, recidivism rate versus reoffending. That's what we're really trying to come down to. Uh, we're the big people. We're supposed to be taking care of the little people. And if that means that, uh, hey, I'm sorry, you did it once, uh, Larry Don McQuay, good example, uh, admitted uh, molesting 300 children on a school bus. He was a school bus driver in, in, in uh, Dallas. Um, he said, I want to be castrated. Physically, chemically, I don't care. Because if you let me out again, I'm going to do it again. Well, that was the, uh, the benchmark for uh, monitoring these guys with uh, you know, GPS and everything else, because he was under the uh, mandatory early release program. We had to let the guy go. Uh, you know, I would have been happy to accommodate him, but we had to let him go. Um, look, if you... If, I, I don't get this. Okay, well, these are acceptable casualties, these are not. You know, nobody is saying somebody urinating in public belongs on the sex offender registry. Certainly not me, and I've been involved with it for since 94. I only have a scant couple of minutes. We have so much here we could do hours on this, as a matter of fact. But right now, I want to go ahead, Melissa, and bring it back to you. Is it still, though, that we need to be judicious? What is it, whom is it that we need to get off these lists? Because the point is made, once you take the innocence of a child, that's something that you can't forgive for the rest of your life. So whom do we remove from these lists and why? I agree with you in terms of uh, everybody wants to protect our children. Um, a couple uh, additional statistics. You can tell I'm an academic because I keep referring to studies. Uh, one thing is that <laughs> studies now are consistently showing that the registries actually do are not effective in terms of reducing recidivism. Uh, one of the big reasons is that we are engaged in what I call stranger danger, which is the fear that our children are being um, uh, stalked by strangers as sexual predators. Unfortunately, statistics don't show that. So for example, if we talk about adult victims, female victims of sexual assault, three out of four of them um, were already familiar with their attackers. Uh, the statistics for children are even uh, more stark than that. So for children who are molested, um, over 90% of them were already familiar with their attacker. And indeed, the younger the age of the child, the more well, likely for, the attacker is a family friend or a, a family member. Okay, hang on one second, Melissa. Rick, you want to go ahead and make a point? For, what does that have to do with anything? You know, I've, I've heard this argument. I receive death threats all the time. You don't understand. It was her uncle that did it. Well, that's even worse. Not only have they violated a child's innocence phys physically, they've taken away the trust of the family. And by the way, Amber's alert, the, the registry was never intended to be a deterrent. It was intended to be information. Look, we can let this guy back out on the street, but you have a right to know if a convicted sex offender is living across the street, you probably don't want him on the babysitting list. Melissa, does common sense at least tell us that it's better to be extra careful than not careful at all? Uh, agreed. My point there was uh, not that family members is not um, a very abusive event. And indeed, we have what we call betrayal trauma, which is actually it's worse when it's a family member or a family friend. The point is that the registries were based on the idea of knowing about strangers. And instead, because uh, most child victims are predated on by people known to them, the registries don't really provide them that additional information. Rick, does it bother you that indeed anybody may get off this list at any time? Uh, as I said, uh, the registry was never intended to deter crime. It was, it was supposed to be an informational database so that parents could know if the guy down the street 
uh, that's spending way too much time with uh, little Johnny. It was a former sex offender. That's what it was for. It was never intended to deter crime, ever. And as far as, you know, whether it's a family member or a total stranger, it doesn't make any difference to me. Once you take the innocence of that child, you're done. We got your name, and it's there forever. Again, I don't think if, uh, you know, you're out on a country road with a bunch of cattle uh, urinating, you ought to be on the list. That's absurd. We are finding ourselves at a time when we're going to have to make some decisions sooner or later on this because the studies keep coming back and telling us that something needs to be done. Unfortunately, we are all out of time. I would love to have the two of you back on again. And next time, let's focus on some solutions here. We know what the numbers tell us. We know what the stats tell us. Let's focus on some solutions and see what we could do because you both are very strong on these opinions. Yes. I thank you both for your time. Melissa and Rick, Absolutely. thank you very much. All right. Thank we got to do this again because now let us look for a way forward on this. Later on this hour, just what we need, driverless cars, another reason to text and keep our eyes on anything but the road. And after the break, the Money Master is here with news as Warren Buffett becomes part of the king leaving the United States for Canada. Order up. Midpoint continues right after this.